Hi, welcome back to part two of whatever this is with a new entourage of students to ask me some questions. So Naomi is second year, media studies. Lauren Spencer are currently running towards the finishing line of their dissertation by practice working together. And Oscar, Cathy and Rob are firstlings who have been brought in dragged out of a course board because they are responsible course board reps and student ambassadors so I thought they'd have uh, something interesting to ask me or to say. So we're going to do the same again, just have a little whiz round and see what happens. Naomi. Yes, so um, I would like to know why you first got into teaching? What made you first decide to teach? Well I actively didn't want to be a teacher. Uh, it was my aim to not be a teacher because quite a lot of my family are teachers. My dad is a sociology lecturer, uh, went to Cambridge, worked with Stuart Hall, kind of, I was brought up with that awareness. I mean, my dad wasn't around when I was a kid, but I was brought up with that awareness of uh, academic lifestyle. And my mum was an art teacher in London in the 60s, but was a bit traumatised by it and didn't really carry on. But a lot of my aunties and uncles are uh, teachers, so... I always thought it'd be the one thing that I would definitely not do would be to teach. And then I accidentally fell into media production because a friend of a friend in Sheffield said something about interviewing bands. And I was like, what do you mean interviewing? What does that even mean? She went, oh, well, doing this thing for ROTT on BBC Radio Sheffield, you can go along and interview your favourite bands and get into the gigs for nothing. That was it. So I went, well, can I do that? And she went, yeah, I think so, just turn up. So I did. And in those days, it was all flashing blades and tape everywhere. And you know, it was an amazing environment, that old analogue production studio thing. And Joe Wobble played at the Lead Mill in Sheffield. And I went along with a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and interviewed him and made every mistake possible to make. And kind of thought, wow, that's amazing. They salvaged a minute out of this 20-minute interview that I did put it out on uh, BBC Radio Sheffield. So I just really did that for 10 years as a hobby, like to get into the gigs for nothing and meet my favourite musicians. And then when I moved to Brighton, I walked into Festival Radio, as it was back in the day, and said, can I do something? And they went, yeah, we've got this community access show. Would you mind working on that? You'll probably have to show people what to do a bit. And I was like, yeah, fine. And as soon as I started showing people how to edit, I just loved it. I really loved seeing that light go on in people's eyes of like, oh, I see, I didn't know that's how it worked, and now I can do that. I really liked it. And I did that for two or three years, just doing little radio workshops and started producing more shows. And then I got a job at the University of East London um, from my production experience teaching radio production that I did for 15 years teaching radio before I got into video. <clears throat> so it kind of sneaked up on me, in spite of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren? Um, what would you say you've brought from martial arts into your teaching style now? Well, it's interesting, Lauren, isn't it, about what you can learn from different environments and this thing about the comfort zone. It's like, I... Well, I was punk in the countryside, and people wanted to beat me up a lot. It was This was like 1977 in a place where people didn't even know it was a fashion then. They just thought you were a freak weirdo and wanted to beat you up. So I sort of spent a lot of time in my life really, really scared on the streets and really kind of avoiding groups of lads and like just pissed up blokes were always terrifying to me. And I kind of got to a stage about 16 where I thought, I can't live like this. I'm not willing to compromise who I am or how I look, but I can't be walking down the street in fear every time I walk down the street. So I made myself go to karate, which for me was a little bit like you sitting in here, like not wanting to do it and feeling scared and like then doing it anyway. And like the first thing that I learned is like, whatever you fear is worse than the actual doing it. Once I, once I did it, I was terrified of being beaten up and being in a fight. I've never had a fight in my life, I've got to say at 51, never had a fight in my life, never hit anybody or been hit by anybody, and that's quite an achievement to me. But So other than kind of 
getting over that, like sparring with somebody or like all that fighting stuff. I hated it. Didn't want to do it. I, only, I did it because I didn't want to do it. And then what I realised was that I was a terrible student. I always thought I knew better than the teachers. Well, that is disastrous in a martial arts class if you think you know better than a teacher. So I learned quite quickly that following instructions was a good idea. That was my first experience of, yeah, that really hurts if I don't follow that instruction. So then I've kind of brought that into my teaching around production is like, I'm not saying what I know is exactly how it is, but it is a bit tried and tested over 20 years. So I'm suggesting to you do this with the kit or do that. Then after you've done it for a couple of years, if you come up with a better idea, brilliant. So there's something about that learning cycle of just accepting that somebody knows better about a bit of kit or something practical and experimenting with it. It was really, really helpful to me. And then the other thing was about, it's called a dojo, karate gym class thing. It's like, as you know, you walk in and you acknowledge that you're walking into a space that is not about being somebody's mate. It's about learning something very serious with very serious consequences if you get it wrong. So that's kind of how I, this might sound a little bit poncy for teaching video, but when I go into the classroom before you lot arrive, I've nearly always been in the classroom first. I've nearly always gone round, tidied up all the chairs, put everything in, in the right place, set up my space. So it is a ritualistic safe space for people to come into and do something that what I notice is if people walk into a space and the chairs are everywhere and everything's all over the place, people are like that straight away. If it's tidy and everything's kind of ready to go, people sort of sit ready to go. So, yeah, it was very useful for me that. I still hate fighting. I still didn't want to do it. But I it took me a few years to be able to walk down the street and feel like if it came to it, I could probably defend myself against the average pissed up bloke so that I didn't have to think about it. But then would I wade in to save somebody else if they were in trouble? I don't know. That's a whole nother ball game. It kind of be nice to think I could do that, but I don't really want to either. So yeah, it's very scary for me that I still find it all really scary, all that stuff. But I was glad I did it because it meant I didn't have to worry about it anymore. Thanks. Well, I'll expand from there. We, we know you're quite a performative character then. So, um, I'm a what? A performative character. Am I? Oh, yeah. Right. Say so if you've been a punk, oh, so, you're yeah. creative. Um, but yeah, I definitely say you use that in terms uh, and you implement that in the classroom. Like you like role play. Um, like the other day we did debates, mock debates. And we sat down and we debated each other's arguments. Like, why would you say you use that form uh, of teaching method? Uh, yeah, I mean that's another one of those things. That I don't like it any more than I like doing karate. It's just unfortunately it works. It's like presenting, it's like, there's only one way to get good at presenting, you just have to stand up and do it, it's horrible. Everybody hates it, everybody hates the sound of their own voice, everybody's cringy, self-conscious, awfulness. I don't know, it's just, it's just one of those things, it helps flick something in your head, I don't know whether it's a left-right brain thing or something, especially if you play a role play in a debate that is the opposite of what you normally think it flicks something in your head that it lets you release the demons almost so that when you come back to your normal point of view it's like ah now I've got the other side I kind of get it mm -hmm. so like that's for me my automatic thing is it's very easy, easy to say you know you care blah 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 horrible stupid people blah, blah, blah. but it's like can I think like that for five minutes why that why that point of view is like it is because it's very popular it's not my personal point of view, but if I can do that and then come back to mine, maybe that might allow me to communicate in a way that'd be more useful on the planet and be a bit more accepting. I don't have to agree. I think it's about acceptance, actually, role play. It's practicing acceptance, which isn't anything to do with whether you agree with it or not. So, yeah, it is cringy and awful, and sorry I asked it's you to do that, like but it, it kind of works. So, yeah, if it works, use it. Oh, enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> You're not meant to enjoy it. That's ah, an accidental byproduct. <laughs> um, with regards to asking questions and lectures and seminars, how do you go about drawing the questions out from students? Because a lot of the time, if you ask them something, they don't actually respond. So how do you go about actually 
getting them to respond? Well, it's got worse, that, you know. It's like what I realise is that what people are learning at school now is devastating. They're learning to keep their heads down and not ask anything and hopefully nobody will notice them. So it's like I've got a bunch of people in the room who are there to learn. That when I say, have you got any questions, everybody goes no and looks away and hopes I don't catch their eye. I mean, what the hell's that about? Paying 40 grand and you have no questions, are you having a laugh? But I know, that's the way it is. I think that is the byproduct of a devastating education system. So unfortunately, again, it's one of those things around go around, just go around. Or pick on people. So if my video lot are in an auditorium and I'm doing a big lecture, I'll just automatically start dotting around them because they'll say something because I've trained them, I've broken them down. But um, the open days are a classic example. And I, this is, I, I've invented this, so I'm going to say this on camera because I'm pretty pleased with this one. So I say to an open day, a bunch of people who are there to decide whether they're coming to Brighton Uni or not, that's a big decision. Have you got any questions? Nothing. Tumbleweed. So now what I do is I send all my darling ambassadors in to collect their questions in the break and bring them back to me and I write them on the board. 15 questions straight away. Ask them, have you got any questions? Nothing. Absolutely 100% guaranteed every time. Now what's wrong with people? What's wrong with us? Why are we so scared to ask a question? I mean, it's, that's devastating. So it's just whatever works. Anything to get people to speak, because everybody's got a question all the time. I've always got, I've got hundreds of questions all the time. I have to stop myself. So, yeah, that's it, really. A mixture of going round or picking on people or some kind of technique of sending people in to get them. Catty. Um, I know you use your diagram of the convex concave. Oh, I. And, um, I was just wondering, like, and I, from what I gathered, it's about seeing things from a different perspective. So do you want to expand on what you think that's about? Yeah, it's a bit similar to the role play thing. The convex concave thing is a shape like that. It's either concave, if you look at it that way, or convex, if you look at it that way. What most people do, and the reason why a C or a 2-2 two -two is average, is that most people look at it from one particular point of view and then find other information to prove that that is right. So that's the, that is a subjective descriptive mode. A critical analytical mode is being able to move around something. Whether you agree with it or not is irrelevant. So that's the debate model is it's convex, it's concave. But if you're up here or down there, then it's different. So that could be something from another discipline, social anthropology, sociology, psychology, Somebody in Japan might think something different. It's like, how many angles can you approach something from? It's like what Megan was saying before about ideas. You can make a, anything about anything if you can look round, but most people stick to something, fixate on it a bit, and just go, well, it's obvious it's concave. You can see it's concave. Look, well, everything's just a point of view. That's really what it comes down to. Can you... Like, the people who get most, most frustrated in my students are people who get 58-59 or 68-69. Usually work really, really hard and go, why can't I get past that thing? Well, it's because they're just a bit stuck. It's not about working harder, it's about seeing wider, moving around a little bit more. That's what that one's about. Roberto. <laughs> cool, so you've obviously been on a really big journey been through so many phases in your life, so many teaching styles, and the one you have currently uh, is very unconventional. Uh, my class isn't in a lecture theatre, it's in more of a classroom style. Uh, you don't use PowerPoints and you make all the chairs into a semicircle, they're not um, in a square. Uh, why, do you, why do you pick this mm. over something much more conventional, which the majority of people use? Uh, well, I don't like right angles. <laughs> I don't. I think we're absolutely obsessed by right angles. Look around us in this world. Everything's a bloody right angle. Windows, computers, everything. You know, what, what's that about? It doesn't exist in nature, a right angle. So why, why sitting in lines? I mean, that's industrial revolution, factory fodder. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in creating somebody to 
work in a factory. So if you go back um, into more traditional traditional time, what was it, like olden times, or look at shamanic ways of teaching, everything's in a circle, everything. So I've kind of borrowed bits of personal development and bits of shamanic stuff around. In, in shamanic work, there was have a talking stick. So in my radio classes, I used to have a stopwatch, and I used to pass a stopwatch around, and it's like you talk for a minute. So I had a kind of digital talking stick device, and I, I don't really, I haven't really found a way of doing that in video land the same, but I've just let go of the stick or the stopwatch thing, and I just do it anyway. So, yeah, that's it. I don't like right angles. That's what it comes down to, that one. Sounds good to me. I mean, I don't want to talk at people. That's the thing, is a classroom is set up, you know, like with a thing at the front and a teacher standing over you, imparting information at you whilst you receive it and take something, some crumbs away from the table. You know, it's not my style. 